live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering theCUBE, New York City 2018. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone to theCUBE NYC. This is theCUBE's live coverage covering CUBE NYC, Strata Hadoop, Strata Data Conference. All things data happening here in New York this week. I'm John Furrier with Peter Burris. Our next guest is Beth Steele Power Q, who's the lead solutions marketing manager, digital business automation within BMC. Uh, Return was here last year with us, and also Big Data SV, which now has been renamed Cube NYC, Cube SV, because it's not just big data anymore. We're hearing words like multi cloud, Istio, all this Kubernetes. Data now is so important, it's now up and down the stack, impacting everyone. We talked about this last year with Control M, how you guys are automating in a hurry, the four pillars of pipelining data. The setup days are over. Welcome to theCUBE. Well, thank you, and it's great to be back on theCUBE. And yeah, what you said is exactly right. So, you know, big data has really, I think, now been distilled down to data. Everybody understands data is big and it's important, <laughs> and it is really, you know, it's, it's quite a cliche, but, but I, to a large degree, true data is the new oil, as people say. And I think what you said earlier is important that, you know, we've been very fortunate to be able to not only follow the journey of our customers, but be a part of it. So about six years ago, uh, some of the early adopters of Hadoop came to us and said that, look, we use your products for traditional data warehousing on the ERP side for orchestration workloads. We're about to take some of these projects on Hadoop into production and really feel that uh, the Hadoop ecosystem is lacking enterprise grade workflow orchestration tools. So we partnered with them and some of the earliest goals they wanted to achieve was build a data lake, provide richer and wider data sets to the end users to be able to do some dashboarding, customer 360, and things of that nature. Very quickly, in about five years time, we have seen a lot of these projects mature from, you know, how do I build a data lake to now applying cutting edge ML and AI, and cloud is a major enabler of that. Um, you know, it's really, as we were talking about earlier, it's really taking away excuses for uh, not being able to scale quickly from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, now you're talking about, is it Hadoop, or is it S3, is it Azure Blob Storage, is it Snowflake? And from a control M perspective, we're very platform and technology agnostic. So some of our customers who had started with Hadoop as a platform, uh, they are now looking at other technologies like Snowflake. Um, so one of our customers describes it as kind of the spine or a power strip uh, of orchestration where regardless of what technology you have, you can just plug and play in and not worry about how do I rewire the orchestration workflows because Control M is taking care of it. Well, you probably always have to worry about that to some degree, but I think where you're going, and this is what I'm going to test with you, is that as analytics, as data is increasingly recognized as a strategic asset, as analytics increasingly is recognized as the way that you create value out of those data assets, and as a business becomes increasingly dependent upon the output of analytics to make decisions and ultimately through AI to act differently in markets, you are embedding these capabilities or these technologies deeper into the business. They have to become capabilities. They have to become dependable, they have to become reliable, predictable, cost, performance, all these other things. That suggests that ultimately the historical approach of focusing on the technology and trying to apply it to a periodic or series of data science problems has to become a little bit more mature so it actually becomes a strategic capability. So the business can say, we're operating on this, but the technologies to take that underlying data science technology to turn it into business operations, that's where a lot of the network has to happen. Is that yeah. what you guys are focused yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the big differences that we're seeing in general in the industry is that this time around, the the, the pull of, of how do you enable technology to drive the business is really coming from the line of business versus starting on the technology side of the house and then coming to the business and say, hey, we've got some cool technologies that can probably help you. It's really line of business now saying, no, I need better analytics so that I can drive new business models for my company, right? So the need for speed is, is greater than ever because the, the pull is from the line of business mm -hmm. side. And this is another area where we are unique is that you know, Control M has been designed in a way where it's not just a set of solutions or tools for the technical uh, guys. Now, 
the line of business is getting closer and closer, the, that, that you know, it's blending into the technical side as well. They have a very, very keen interest in understanding are the dashboards going to be refreshed on time? Are we going to be able to get all the right promotional offers at the right time? I mean, we're here at NYC mm -hmm. Strata. You know, there's a lot of real-time promotion happening here. The line of business has direct interest in, in the uh, delivery and the timing of, of all of this. So we have always had multiple interfaces to control them where a business user who has an, who has an interest in understanding um, are the promotional offers going to happen uh, at the right time and is that on schedule? They have a mobile mm -hmm. app for them to do that. A developer who's building a complex multi-application platform, they have a API and a programmatic inter interface to do that. Operations that has to monitor all of this has rich dashboards to be able to do that. So that, that's one of the areas uh, has been key for our success over the last couple of decades and we're seeing that translate uh, very well into the big So I want to just uh, go into the hood for a minute because I love, love that answer and I like to pivot off Peter said, tying it back to the business. Okay, that's awesome. And I want to just kind of learn a little bit more about this because we talked about this last year and I'm kind of seeing it now. Kubernetes and all this orchestration is about workloads. You guys nailed the workflow issue, complex workflows. If you look at it, if you're adding line of business into the equation, that's just complexity in and of itself as more workflows exist within its own line of business, whether it's recommendations and offers and workflow issues, more lines of business in there, it's complex for IT to even deal with. So you guys have nailed that. How, right. how does that work? I mean, like you plug it in and the lines of business to have their own developers. So the people who care about the workflows engage how? So that's a good question. And with uh, sort of orchestration and automation now becoming very, very generic, it's kind of important to classify where we play. So there's a lot of tools that do release and build automation. There's a lot of tools that'll do infrastructure uh, automation and orchestration. All of this infrastructure and release management process is done ultimately to run applications on top of it. And the workflows of the application need orchestration, and that's, that's the layer that we play in. And if you think about how does the end user, the business, and consumer interact with all this technology is through applications, okay? So the orchestration of the workflows inside the applications, whether you start all the way from an ERP or a CRM, and then you land into a data lake, and then do an ML model, and then out come the recommendations analytics, that's the layer we are automating today. Obviously all Automating those, away the technical complexity for the users. Correct, and the line and the of, apps. so the line of business obviously has a lot more control. You're seeing roles like chief digital officers emerge, you're seeing, you know, CTOs that have mandates like, okay, you're going to be responsible for all applications that are facing, customer facing, where the CIO is going to take care of everything that's inward facing. It's not a settled yeah. uh, structure or science it's anymore. Evolving it's, it's evolving fast. Yeah. But what's clear is the line of business has a lot more interest and influence in driving these technology projects. And it's important that technologies evolve in a way where the line of business can not only understand but take advantage of them. So I think it's a great question, John, and I want to build on that and then ask you something. So the way we look at the world is we say the first 50 years of computing were known process, unknown technology. The next 50 years are going to be unknown process, known technology. It's all going to look like a cloud. Right. But think about what that means. Known process, unknown technology, control M and related types of technologies tended to focus on how you put in place predictable workflows in the technology layer. And now, unknown process, known technology, driven by the line of business, now we're talking about controlling process flows that are being created, bespoke, strategic, differentiating well, to the business. Well, dynamic too, I mean. Highly dynamic. Yeah. And, that's, and, and those workflows, in many respects, those technologies, piecing applications, services together, become the process that differentiates the business. It's a, it, you know, you're, not, you're still focused on the infrastructure to a bit. He's got to nail the technical complexity. Up. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we see our goal as abstracting the complexity of the underlying application data and infrastructure. So, I mean, just, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So it can be that easier reconfigured to recon the business exactly, needs. Exactly, so you know, whether you are on Hadoop and now you're thinking about moving to Snowflake uh, or tomorrow something else that comes up, the 
orchestration of the workflow, you know, that's as a, as a business, as a, as a product, that's our goal is to continue to evolve uh, quickly and in a manner that we continue to abstract the complexity so so I got to ask you, we're having a lot of conversations around Hadoop versus Kubernetes, multi-cloud. So as cloud has certainly come in and changed the game, there's no debate on that, how it changes is debatable, but we know that multiple clouds are going to be the modus operandi for customers. Correct. So I got a lot of data now, I got pipeline <laughs> complexities and workflows are going to even get more complex, potentially. Um, how do you see the impact of the cloud? How are you guys looking at that? And what are some customer uh, use cases that you see for you guys? So the, uh, what I mentioned earlier, that being platform and technology agnostic is actually one of the, the unique differentiating factors for us. So whether you are an AWS or an Azure or Google or on-prem or still on a mainframe, a lot of the, we're in New York, a lot of the banks, insurance companies here still do some of the most critical processing on the mainframe. Uh, the ability to abstract all of that, uh, whether it's cloud or, or you know, legacy solutions, is one, one of our uh, key enablers for our customers. And I'll give you an example. So Malwarebytes is one of our customers and you know, they've been using Control-M for several years. Um, primarily, the entire infrastructure is built on, on AWS, but they are now utilizing Google Cloud for some of their recommendation engines and sentiment analysis because their, their, their goal is to pick the best of breed technology for the problem that service, they're going to the solve. Best the best of breed in services in the cloud to solve the business problem. And so for, from a control image perspective, that transcending from AWS to Google Cloud is, is you know, uh, completely abstracted for, for them. So when it's Google, tomorrow it's Azure, they decided to build a private cloud, uh, they will be able to extend the same uh, but workflow. But you can build these workflows across whatever set of services are Correct. available, whatever not, not only, and it's you bring up an important point. It's not only being able to build the workflows across platforms, but being able to uh, define dependencies and track the dependencies across all of this, because none of this is happening in silos. If you're, you know, if you want to use Google's API to do the recommendations, well, you've got to feed it uh, the data, and the data is pipeline, like, like we talked about last time, data ingestion, data storage, mm -hmm. data processing, and analytics have very, very intricate dependencies and being able, you, the solution should be able to manage not only the building of the workflow, but the dependencies But as you're well. defining those elements as fundamental building blocks through a control model. Correct. That allows you to then treat the higher level services as reliable, consistent Correct. capabilities. And the other thing I would like to add here is not only just build complex multi-platform, multi-application workflows, but never lose focus of the business service, the business process that they're, so you can tie all of this to a business service and then these things are complex, there are problems, let's say there's an ETL job that fails somewhere upstream, Control will in immediately be able to predict the impact and be able to tell you, this means that the recommendation engine will not be able to make the recommendations. Now, the staff that's going to work on our mediation understands the business impact versus looking at um, a screen where there's 500 jobs and one of them has failed, what does that really mean? And set priorities and focal points and everything else. Right. So I want to just wrap up by um, asking you how your talk went at Strata Hadoop Data Conference. Uh, what were you talking about? What was the core message? Was it Control M? Was it customer presentations? What was the, what was the focus? So we, uh, the focus of yesterday's talk was to actually, you know, one of the things is, uh, uh, academic uh, talk is great, but it's it's important to you know show how things work in real life. So the the session was focused on a real use case from a customer, um, Navistar. They have uh, IoT uh, data driven pipelines where they are predicting um, failures of parts inside trucks and buses that they manufacture and you know reducing vehicle downtime. So we wanted to simulate a demo like that. So that's exactly what we did and it was very well received. In real time, we spun up uh, EMR environment at AWS, automatically provisioned control and infrastructure there. We applied Spark and machine learning algorithms to the data and out came the recommendation at the end was that, you know, here are the vehicles that are... <laughs> Fix their brakes. <laughs> exactly. So it was very, very well... well I mean, there's a real world that. example. There's real money to be saved. Maintenance, scheduling, yes. uh, potential liability, 
accidents. Liability is, is a huge yeah. issue uh, huge. For, for a lot of manufacturers. Navistar has been at the leading edge of how to apply technology they, they really, to that, that They've really been a poster child for digital transformation. Sure Here's a company that's been around for 100 plus years. And yeah. when we talk to them, they, they tell us that we have every technology under the sun that has come since the mainframe. And for them to be the, to be transforming leading in this way, and we're very fortunate to be part of their, their journey. Well, we'd love to talk more about some of these customer use cases that people love about the queue. We want to do more of them, share those examples. People love to see you know, proof <laughs> and yeah. real world examples, not just talks. So I appreciate it, Absolutely. sharing. Thanks for sharing, appreciate it. Thanks for the insights. We're here at Cube Live here in New York City, part of Cube NYC. We're getting all the data, sharing that with you. I'm John Furrier, Peter Burris. Stay with us for more day two coverage after this short break.